diversity and live lighter on the planet. So I'm coming at this from a very community development perspective. Uh, Education-wise, I've got an MBA from Trinity Western in nonprofit management and leadership, and I've got a certificate in sustainability from uh, Simon Fraser. Uh, so I'm really excited to be with you. Got a family back home in Ottawa, three kids and a wife, and uh, I beekeep when I have the time, not taking care of the kids, and I uh, love playing hockey as well. A little bit about me. Thanks, Luke. Um, congrats on being CEO of that company. That's great news. Uh, Derek, really uh, pleased to have you here today, Manager of Innovation Ecosystems at Prairie's Economic Development Canada. Derek, tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks so much, and uh, thanks for the invite. Really happy to be here. Really happy to, you know, talk about Alberta's story. So uh, I'm actually really curious to know who here is not based in Alberta. All right, this is great. So you're going to hear a lot about Alberta today, a lot of bragging. <laughs> but I'm not from Alberta, so um, I'm actually from Ottawa. I grew up, um, born and raised in Montreal, Quebec and then I uh, spent a lot of my career in Ottawa working for the federal government. So I've been with the federal government for 18 years. I like to say I have a, a windy career, but uh, inside the federal government. So inside the federal government, I've had a lot of different positions. Uh, started my career uh, in strategic policy at Environment and Climate Change Canada, uh, advising uh, cabinet directly. So at the time, it was under the Harper government. Uh, numerous ministers, of course, during that time. We had Ambrose, Kent, Baird, Prentice, and so forth. So it was a very interesting time to be working uh, at Environment and Climate Change Canada and seeing those cabinet deliberations, drafting uh, behind the scenes, the presentations and the memoranda, the cabinet and the advice, and uh, what a great experience. And I moved over to Infrastructure Canada for seven years, and I moved to Mon back to Montreal to work on Canada's largest P3 infrastructure project. So it's actually Canada's busiest bridge called the Champlain Bridge. If you've ever been to Montreal, beautiful, it's now fully built from beginning to end. I worked on that at, on the policy side. So. Um, the strategic policy there, and that I did a master's at McGill in Urban uh, Transportation, so that, that, that's what uh, happened there. Then uh, moved out to Calgary. My wife is a specialist at the Alberta Children's here in Calgary, and I said, I have no idea what I'm going to do with the federal government in Calgary. Mm. I might have to go work uh, at Second Cup or something because there's not much federal government presence here in Calgary. But there's an amazing organization called Prairie's Economic Development Canada. We used to be called Western Economic Diversification. So with Prairie's Canada, I've been out here for five years, and I've, it's definitely been my favorite position my entire career. High impact. It's place-based, um, active. Um, uh, 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 programming and so forth, and so I could talk a little bit more about what we do. Um, but essentially, Prairies Can is our mandate is to help diversify and grow uh, the economy of Alberta and of Western Canada. Um, we have different roles, so we invest. We call it invest. Um, we have a lot of different funding programs. I could talk a little bit about that. But we have funding programs for companies directly, for communities. Um, and for not-for-profit organizations, which I'm most passionate about, building that innovation ecosystem here in Calgary, Alberta, do a lot of advising, convening, pathfinding, and also advocating. So what I love to do is advocate on behalf of the interest of Alberta, given my experience in Ottawa, a lot of connections there, because sometimes a lot of people, if you're not from Alberta, you don't realize a lot of the amazing, innovative things that are happening here. So we are here, boots on the ground in Alberta. Um, of course, one of our major, major priorities is clean tech innovation um, and, and energy transition. But we look at all sectors of the economy looking to diversify. So ag tech, life sciences, advanced manufacturing, digital tech, um, and also inclusive. So we want a more inclusive economy out here So women, youth, indigenous groups, and so forth. So that's my background. And uh, really looking forward to diving into some of these topics today. That's great. Thank you, Derek. Appreciate that. I'm going to jump right into questions. We uh, want to get as many questions in from the audience as possible. So we have a few to kick us off here. I'm going to throw to the panel. Luke, I'd like to start with you. Ro what role do you believe innovation plays in addressing current environmental challenges? And can you share examples of innovative solutions that have demonstrated success in promoting sustainability? 
Absolutely. Thanks, Derek. And good to hear your intro. Uh, oh, Derek and Aaron. Aaron, Aaron. Aaron Derek. <laughs> there we go. Uh, well, let's just start off with what is innovation? Uh, do you have a definition in your mind when you think of that word? And uh, this is getting into the hypnotist stuff because you're visualizing something when you think about innovation. Uh, but for the typical person, if they Google it, uh, you're going to see something about bringing new products and services into a space where they have value, into a market where they have value uh, and growth potential. Uh, so that's kind of the standard definition. Uh, if you've studied any of this before, uh, one of the big names that comes to mind is Clayton Christensen, who wrote a book called The Innovator's Dilemma in the 90s and kind of popularized some new ideas around innovation. But I want to just take a poll and, and, and hear from the group here. Uh, what innovations come to mind? Just call them out when you think about innovation. And maybe Tesla is the first one that comes to mind for you because that one's in the news a lot. But shout out an innovation. You're on mic, just speak up. Please. Uh, for me, uh, I apply it to my garden, mixing native plants with other species of plants, experimenting and finding out what works in a specific setting to maximize productivity ecologically. So that's just on my personal level. Excellent. If you didn't hear that, um, our friend at the front here was sharing about a garden, an ecosystem, and native plant innovation, and testing and trying how plants interact and intersect. That's part of my world, biodiversity, uh, and that mix of species and how they work together. Uh, call another one out. Yeah. Excellent. Manufacturing, sustainable packaging. We heard the story yesterday of Bimbo and the, the bread ties uh, innovation. Isn't that interesting? Saving uh, weight in their whole production process. Maybe one more. Yeah. Creating um, food forests to food forest. carbon capture, but also to reduce um, food insecurity. So we've actually uh, pioneered a 250-foot food forest in Chestermere um, that was in collaboration with Rotary Club and the Bee City um, Committee because it also acts as a nice pollinator garden too. Oh, well, that's fantastic. So we've got another community example here of a food forest. Um, I didn't catch the location, but if you're interested in that, uh, follow up with this lady here. So lots of neat things uh, in our minds when we think of innovation. Uh, but what role does it actually play? Well, the famous McKinsey uh, company said that 80% of CEOs want to prioritize innovation. But what's the problem in the gap? 10% are satisfied with how their innovation is actually being executed. So there's a huge gap and a huge opportunity when it comes to innovation, uh, whether it's social or whether it's energy or manufacturing or whatever sector it is. Across the board, there's a gap here. And when we talk about the uh, environmental sustainability challenges, we need to close that gap. That's why this topic of leading the charge is really important. Uh, and I'm going to share a little bit more about leadership in a second, but let me take a quick drink. Uh, so if we believe what, uh, who was it yesterday, Dan Wicklum, the accelerator transition fellow who did the keynote, if we believe what he's saying about we actually need a systems change, that requires innovation. Uh, let me give you uh, two quick examples from my world and then uh, I'll pass it off to the second question. Um, Anybody heard of iNaturalist? Put up your hand if you've heard of iNaturalist. Okay, awesome. So we got maybe 10% or less that have heard about iNaturalist. This was a fantastic innovation in our industry, in our world of conservation monitoring and restoration. So you can picture the folks in my world, scientists, conservation folks, who are out there in the forest, in the prairie land, in the stream. They've got a clipboard and a pen and they're tracking what they're seeing, and that's the way of gathering data. But guess what happened? With apps and technology, iNaturalist came along, and it, now we can just snap a photo of what we see, and we have access to a network of experts from around the world, and we can identify that species. 
Uh, and that contributes to an incredible data set around the world. But it also, at a social level, makes everyone in this room a naturalist. That is a very cool innovation that's part of our world. And we're trying to teach people in our communities how to use that and uh, that they're actually making a difference when they use that. Uh, the second innovation is a bit more of a social one. That, that was more of a technical one, but uh, the organization I lead, as I shared before, I think it's a pretty innovative idea. It started off as a birding observatory in Portugal, hence the funny word, well not funny, the Portuguese word, uh, that means the rock. So we started as this bird observatory on the Algarve coastline in Portugal that combined hospitality and sharing meals together with going out and bird watching. Uh, and that grew around the world because in the 70s and 80s as the environmental movement was picking up, uh, there was a group of people of faith who said, why shouldn't we have environment and faith combined? So there's an example of an innovation where you combine two things that you don't always think go together, but actually really do go together. Um, so part of my story is I'm attracted to the, the good that comes out of that innovation. And a lot of people who uh, connect with us have that same story where they're kind of waking up to realize, oh, the beliefs I have actually say something important about uh, the planet and the world. So there's a couple examples for you. That's great. Thanks, Luke. Uh, Derek, I see you have a microphone now. Um, I don't think the karaoke machine is working, but do you have anything to add for the um, question that we asked? I don't have anything to add. Um, typically, when we're talking about technology, I always break it, so this is totally me. <laughs> like, uh, I'm, an, I'm an investor, and I enable it, but um, yeah, so I, you know, I think let's move on to the next question, which is around, uh, yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, um, maybe, Luke, just to follow up a little bit, so how do you think technology can lead into the... Um, uh, utilizing technology for sustainability. Yeah. Uh, three quick, simple things here. I think let people fail and re redesign. Let people pilot things. I think we have to be okay with uh, a little bit of trial and error. Um, uh, give people the sandbox, the tech world. Uh, I don't know if that metaphor is passe now, but let people play a little bit. Try things out in the sandbox. and. Uh, Get, get in touch with people who know how to run a hackathon. Um, those are folks that come together to solve a really big challenge and bring interdisciplinary skills to the mix. And uh, the next generation is all about this idea of hackathons. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I, I think I just would add that, like, it's interesting to hear about, you know, some of the, like the, I think some of the examples were a little bit more kind of low tech practices and I think those are really important when it comes to innovation but in my space in my world it's about tech tech it's about hard tech it's about digital tech I think that's where uh, some of the most game-changing opportunities are are going to be found uh, you know I'm not discounting some of the low-tech practices like especially in agriculture uh, a huge area that we're looking at and we're actually supporting is regenerative ag and that's you know a, that's literally practices using the soil in different ways and so forth. Um, but where I'm most excited about is really some of these like tech areas that can solve major, major problems. So like if we want to, you know, grow more food more sustainably, there's so much tech happening. There's like IoT sensors that you can embed in the soil that will measure, you know, uh, soil mo moisture so precisely that it speaks to the irrigation systems and it'll only use as much water as, as only that's required. So it's going to reduce water use. Um, there's drones, there's autonomous vehicles in agriculture right now. There's post harvest technologies that could reduce energy use. Um, and that's just in ag. Uh, do we want to produce and use more, uh, uh, use less energy? energy, uh, more energy with less emissions. So there's like, that. this is a huge space here, of course, here in Alberta. So there's electrification technologies, as we all know, with Tesla and all the, those other companies. We have hydrogen. Uh, Dan Wickham spoke to that yesterday, I'm sure. That is a huge opportunity for Alberta. Um, carbon uh, is, is a major uh, politicized issue right now, so carbon emissions. But what we have an, as an opportunity there is to capture it, to utilize it, to use carbon as potentially an asset for us, to embed it 
into products, to embed it into cement, to use it for different things. Actually, there's some potential game-changing opportunities to use uh, bitumen instead of combusting the carbon. We're actually um, looking at uh, converting it to carbon fiber uh, for, for, for vehicles, for things like hockey sticks is kind of what's made the news because, of course, here in Canada, Am I being hypnotized? Speaking of karaoke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> At least it's you too. All good. <laughs> All good. I can't multitask. So some, if I'm distracted, I'm like, I can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Happens all the time. That's all good. And then the second part of the question around how can organizations use tech to lead, like, I think for me, it's all about, you know, adopting and integrating tech into your existing operations, but you got to be careful there. You have to do it incrementally, and you have to de-risk it, and you have to start off with the lowest risk technologies first. Like, we have such high expectations of, like, farmers to say, like, why don't you just adopt all the, this, like, cool, amazing tech? They're just like, heck no, like, I'm a farmer, and I, if I lose a crop or a season or whatnot, I'm screwed. So that's why we are funding things like Smart Farms at Olds College, um, which is one of the world, one of Canada's top smart farms where um, adopters can go and test the technologies and see it in operations, and then you know potentially adopt it in an incremental, slower way, um, and it won't um, uh, cease their operations. So, you know, go out and get help with it. Don't do these things alone. If you're looking at integrated tech, there's so many organizations there out there that can help you adopt, um, and that's where government plays. Like we're funding all these like test beds and sandboxes and smart farms and applied research and, and labs and prototyping demonstration. And the reason government's funding it is so that SMEs um, who might not you know want to spend the time and money on these things because everything's going well, um, it's it's being, uh, it's very, very low cost because of that government subsidy. So, yeah. Thank you, Derek. So, as we move from the thought of innov innovation, need to think about economic advocacy for such things. So, how do you see the integration of environmental innovation contributing to the economic growth in the Prairies region and beyond, Derek? Well, I think for us, it, it, it's key. This is my mandate. Our mandate is to, you know, grow and diversify the economy. Um, and we see environmental innovation, clean tech, energy transition as as the way, the number one way we're going to do that. I always actually say that uh, clean tech, uh, energy transition is the biggest economic opportunity of our lifetimes. And that's not only me saying it, those are other, a lot of people are saying that I see it as a huge economic opportunity. Um, and, uh, you know, Calgary Economic Development here, like my counterpart with the city, they, they conducted an energy transition study. And they concluded that we have the potential to create 170,000 new clean tech jobs that will contribute to $61 billion in the GDP to the Alberta's economy by 2050. So that's a massive opportunity that we have in front of us. We just have to seize it. And um, they also, the study looked at it and it said that if we do nothing, we're going to actually see job losses and a drop in GDP. So we really um, have to really uh, go after it. And what do we need? Of course, that's what keeps me up at night. How can we actually get those jobs and get that GDP. It's just a lot that need that is needed. We need you know massive capital investment from different sources, from government, of course, from the private sector. We need foreign direct investment. We need strong climate policy. Um, we need you know leadership. We definitely need reskilling. We have all the talent here, uh, energy talent that's been here for generations. But there's a reskilling that's required into clean tech, and there's a lot of programs that we have. So 
supported to do that with some of our uh, PSIs and, and, and polytechnics. Um, but yeah, that's exactly it. There is, of course, an Alberta advantage. This is our number one opportunity out here in Alberta. Um, we have the energy sector here already. We have those skills that naturally lend themselves to clean tech. Um, we have the infrastructure, we have the capital, a lot of that capital sitting on the sidelines that needs to be deployed into clean tech. And that's a lot of what I'm working on as well, is programs to help that oil and gas money get deployed back into the tech sector, specifically clean tech. So um, I actually think, you know, I always say environmental innovation is synonymous with economic growth. And uh, I, I always repeat that phrase, we're an energy powerhouse, we're an agriculture powerhouse, but if we want to be, continue to do that in the future and be that in the future, we're really going to have to adopt environmental innovation. And uh, yeah. Thank you. Luke, when I think of some of the work you do with the conservation projects and the agricult agricultural initiatives, um, what do you think some of the benefits are to the local economies for those? Yeah, good question, and, and super inspiring, uh, Derek, to hear you share there. Um, yeah, I think that uh, one story I want to share is around a project that we're working on with the Semiamu First Nation. It's called uh, Shared Waters Alliance. And um, from an economic perspective, it's not huge, but it's, it's about shellfish, and one of their food sources has been shellfish at the end of... Uh, the Tataloo River in BC, where Boundary Bay is, if any of you know that area. Uh, so we've been working with the Semiamu people for a long time and have uh, pulled together to try and reopen the shell fishery that got closed because of uh, fecal coliform in the river. Um, and as, as many of you scientists will know, uh, shellfish are bile valve and they, they filter what's in the water and then they hold on to that. So it's uh, toxic and dangerous to eat uh, if there's too much of that uh, pollutant in the water. So uh, one of the things we're trying to do is, is work with all the stakeholders to reopen that, and I think that would have a significant em economic impact uh, on their lives, especially with the cost of food uh, increasing so much. Um, there's a few other parts there, but I think I'll share them at other questions. Great. Just one example for you. Thank you. Well, there's, there's barriers to all work. Um, I'm sure we all experienced it. What kind of barriers can you gentlemen talk about um, with um, stakeholder engagement and driving environmental sustainability and innovation? Like what strategies are effective in getting support and involvement from various stakeholders? Yeah. Um, Derek, do you want to kick Can I jump in on that? Because yeah, yeah. it oh, kind of yeah. ties to my, my next point there. So in the same uh, story of the Shared Waters Alliance, uh, there are five main funding partners and there are 25 stakeholders, not including landholders in the area. So this is a huge uh, group of people to try and bring together over one challenge. And I think uh, what's made it successful is two things. Uh, and hopefully this helps you in your journey of trying to overcome these challenges and barriers as you uh, drive innovation. You've got to have a compelling story. Um, and, and this story is a really compelling story. Um, so I think we've got that and that drew people together. And then you've got to have those advocates um, and champions who know how to bring diverse people together and actually move them forward. And I think those have been the two success factors that have got us through many barriers. Uh, maybe the third thing is uh, we've had an example of success as well. Across the border, uh, they've reopened the shell fishery uh, just acro across in Washington. And so we've got this visualization of that it's possible. Um, so that goes along with the compelling narrative. But jump in here, Derek. No, uh, I, that's exactly it. I think, you know, <sighs> stakeholder engagement and getting, especially here when it comes in Alberta around the energy transition, something that's so politicized where everyone's trying to take sides, I think it's really important to bring the temperature down and, 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 and depoliticize it, uh, talk in a pragmatic way, use non political language, and just convene people, like I, I think 
people have to stop believing what they read in the news and get off Twitter. And and because behind the scenes, we like work so well together, actually. And um, it's all about collaboration. We're not going to go anywhere if we don't collaborate. I have like a bi-weekly meeting with my counterpart inside the Alberta government. I meet all the time with Calgary Economic Development. I'm. It's all about convening stakeholders and behind the scenes getting stuff done. And so one of my favorite projects that we funded um, inside Prairies Can, $2.1 million into something called the Energy Transition Center in downtown Calgary. And so when I first pitched that to my senior, to executives inside, um, inside Prairies Can, who had been there for maybe 30 years, they were like, there's no way. There's no way we're doing that. That is not going to happen. There's not going to be an energy transition center in downtown Calgary. I was like, we're, we're, we're going to do it. We're doing it. Trust me. I, and I had to really fight the fight inside the government bureaucracy bureaucracy to say, yes, it might be at risk. Yes, it might not be welcomed, but it absolutely has. So it's a collaboration between Innovate Calgary, so University of Calgary, Avatar Innovations, which is a private sector. Uh, they, they, did, they do some programming and they have an investment arm to it as well. So it's a, an industry. The big thing is that industry has embraced the Energy Transition Center, they're sending hundreds of their employees there to take avatar programming to ideate, to collaborate with um, um, uh, academia, and to come up with um, a clean tech energy transition solution. So it's starting at the very, very top end of the funnel, but it's inside oil and gas. And so what's happening now, we funded this two years ago, there are clean tech startups brand new companies coming out of the Energy Transition Center. And last night I spoke at um, an, uh, an event called Startup TNT, which is like a pitch night and access to capital. You have angel investors, you have VCs there. There were four avatar teams there and we're, we're funding Startup TNT. So I was so proud sitting there. I was like, we're funding Energy Transition Center. Startups are coming out of there. Now they're going to access capital at Startup TNT. So it is 100% the most exciting place to be when it comes to energy transition, I think, in the world. Um, and that's not just me. There's third parties like Startup Genome, Startup Blink, saying that Calgary is one of the top emerging clean tech ecosystems in the entire world. So, um, And it's all about bringing people together so that they can collaborate and instead of working in silos and, and being all political about it and so forth. But if you get people in a room together who want to solve these problems, solve these challenges, and make money doing it, you'll get a lot of motivated people. Thank you. So with barriers, there's those challenges and opportunities to overcome. How do you balance the economic development goals for these environmental sustainability projects? It's a very delicate balance. How do, you, how do you get past some of those? Do you want to start on that one? Or? Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I'm going to approach this from my world, which might be a little bit different from the economic development goals, but uh, I think Let's go back to the idea of leadership and leading, because uh, that's part of the headline for this uh, panel. Um, leadership is often thought of as a noun. We use it as a noun, but it's actually a verb, leading. And I think when we confuse those things, um, we, we make mistakes that uh, we could avoid, and we we could miss the ability to solve the toughest challenges in the world when we think that it's my job as the CEO to solve that challenge because I'm at the top of the organization. So we need leaders across the organization and people who are actually leading and seeing leading as an activity and an exercise and a practice and not a thing about my identity. Um, so that's a little bit of a soapbox on leading. My favorite book, if you want to, uh, if you want to dig into this a bit more, is called um, When Everyone Leads, The Toughest Challenges Get Seen and Solved. Uh, and the premise of that is take, take your aspiration and take your challenge and figure out what makes it hard to close that gap. That's where leadership happens, right in that what makes it hard to close the gap. Um, three other things just about the challenges and opportunities uh, in this space. Um, so what, what, a couple of things we've learned is I think there's an opportunity for uh, meditation, contemplation, more reflective uh, 
uh, postures. Um, if you know some of your history around naturalists, Alexander von Humboldt is one of the, the uh, most well-regarded naturalists, and he was a contemplative person. Um, a lot of the scientists, they, they study, they, they reflect, they, they sit. And some of our innovations have come out of that kind of space. So how do we actually make space for that kind of behavior, which seems a little counter-cultural to our typical drive of go, 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 go. Um, how do we actually make space to breathe? Um, I think another challenge in this space is how do we learn to live within limits? Um, uh, you know, I'm coming from a faith perspective and uh, just, the justice side of me says, how do I live with less so that somebody else can live with more? Um, but more importantly, uh, how do we deal with greed and fear? Uh, these are challenges of the heart and, and body and, and mind. And I think they're part of uh, what's a significant challenge and barrier to moving forward. Uh, Derek talked about the, uh, the politicization. You know, it's rooted in fear. Um, and there's a lot of challenges around greed still. Um, you know, I'm not saying I'm against growth. I'm just saying let's think about being wise and prudent about these challenges and not just making the profit motive the single focus. Um, and that's not a new idea. You've heard that before. Uh, and finally, um, from indigenous communities, uh, they're calling us to remember the elders. Um, in my frame of reference, that's sort of like the prophets. Um, who are the wise people um, who are actually challenging us and seeing, seeing some of the future and calling us into that future? Um, in our space, it's been folks like Wendell Berry and, Lauren and Mary Ruth Wilkinson, Eugene Peterson, uh, Margaret Atwood. Uh, these have been people who have uh, just been prophetic in this space. So let's figure out how to listen to the prophets again. Derek? Yeah, no. I, I'm going to sound like a bad person, I think, here. But, like, I take a little bit of a different view than a lot. And I think this is, you know, definitely an Alberta uh, culture thing. And I think businesses, the private sector, they have a responsibility. They, you know, that they need to do their job. They have given Alberta and the rest of Canada the, the, the quality of life and the prosperity that we all have and that we all take advantage of. And so for me, they have, it's, it's difficult for businesses to, to tell a business to say, take less of a profit, um, invest in something that's not going to make you more money. It's actually invest in something that you're going to actually produce less of something and lose money. And so I'm not saying that we should just be out there and just sitting on the sidelines and being like, we're just going to destroy the environment. I think businesses need to stay focused on what their role is, and that is they have a responsibility to their employees, um, to their shareholders, to Canadians to make money. Where I think we can bridge the gap is with government uh, funding, and that's where we can help businesses introduce uh, technologies that will reduce emissions. We can incentivize that. We can, you know, regulate it, but also provide the carrot of uh, investment tax credit. So the, the federal government has a wide array of initiatives, and I think it's somewhat on the right track. I think that there's a lot um, that's uncoordinated and all over the place, but that's kind of... Yeah, some people might say I'm, I'm drinking the Alberta Kool-Aid, but um, I actually think that I take a little bit of a harder line there in terms of business and the responsibility to be a business. Yeah. Well, what's the role of government for fostering innovation, do you think, in this instance? So that's exactly it. Like, I have a long list here, and I'm going to find it. Like, so I think for me, where I come, like, you know, government gets a bad rap 
of course, a lot of the time, especially lately around innovation. So I don't know if you saw that the Canada, Inno Canada Innovation Corporation was supposed to be released and was supposed to be kind of uh, helping our innovation ecosystem. That's been shelved now, potentially till after the next election. Um, there's a wide range of different government departments doing innovation, including myself and, and, and Natural Resources Canada, ECCC, NRC, IRAP, then you have the Shred, you have uh, all these different programs in all these different departments. You have the digital adoption, you have like ag funding, Canada Growth Fund. Uh, Canada Growth Fund's first two big investments ha were actually in Calgary into a geothermal company called Ever and a carbon capture and storage company called Entropy, $900 million. So exciting things happening there. Um, the government has invested in e E3 Metals, which is a lithium development company here in Alberta, uh, air products around hydrogen. Um, you know, of course, they're investing heavily into electric vehicle plants. And I mentioned the investment tax credits around hydrogen and CCUS and so forth. So there's just so much happening inside government. I actually think a lot of that, like, that is billions and billions of funding and incentives and like I worked under the Harper government at Environment Climate Change Canada and there was like 10% of this happening at that time so it is night and day in terms of all the different things that are happening and I think where I come at it though at a high level is I'm just more all about because this is what I do it's all about incentivization it's all about de-risking it's all about helping businesses it's all about um, you know uh, uh, training talent and, and, and addressing the gaps, addressing the barriers, addressing uh, the gap. If a, if a company is saying, well, this isn't going to make me a profit, well, how can we come in and incentivize it? Like, look what's happened with renewables, with solar and wind. Like, a long time ago, it wasn't cost competitive. It required government intervention to come in and kind of bridge that gap. Renewables are booming in Alberta. Like it's, it's, despite the pause from the provincial government, I don't know if you saw that, I think now it's gonna be lifted, but renewables is, is a massive industry. If you drive in Southern Alberta, there's a chance you're going to see trucks hauling these like massive windmills and, and solar panels. So um, it's, it's actually competitive right now and it required that government intervention. So I think that that's the biggest role for government is incentivization, bridging the gap. Thanks, Derek. Um, let's maybe look at the future a little bit, the outlook and trends that we have uh, to consider here. So um, in what ways can the private sector play a pivotal role in driving innovation for environmental sustainability in Canada? And what section or industries do you believe hold the greatest potential for impactful innovations? Luke, do you have any thoughts there? Yeah, I, I think Derek's shared a lot about uh, response to that question. Um, so I might uh, send the question over to you in a minute, but I, I'm biased to hydrogen. Uh, it's a Canadian innovation. Fuel cells were invented in Canada. There's two big companies, uh, Ballard and Hydrogenics. And Cummins Diesel Manufacturing uh, just bought out Hydrogenics. So this diesel company believes in the future of hydrogen. Um, I'd be curious to hear more about you on, on hydrogen there. Um, and I think you said already, you know, let, let's figure out how to fund it and operationalize it. Um, and I think that's, that takes the leadership uh, to the next level. Um, but yeah, curious, curious if you've got any thoughts on hydrogen and uh, yeah, on that I question. Yeah, definitely can talk about hydrogen. Um, but you know, where is all the, you know, what roles private sector play in driving innovation? I think, you know, if, if you read a few articles in the last couple of weeks, of course we're lagging around productivity and uh, Christia Freeland and, and Trudeau are kind of lobby, lobbying that back to the private sector saying like, government can only do so much, the private sector, you're going to have to invest, you're going to have to drive a lot of the innovation. I agree with that somewhat, and that's why we love applied research. Um, we're working with Southern Alberta Institute of Technology, so industry can go there and, at a very, very low cost, um, innovate and 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 do that. But time and money for the private sector, but I think that's where all the innovation should happen. Some of it is happening inside academia, and we're also trying to 
bring out some innovation there. It's definitely more challenging for innovations to come out of academia because these are, you know, they, they, they have to, you know, hire CEOs and COOs and so forth because they don't have that business acumen and it's slow. The commercialization process is really, really slow. But the University of Calgary, to brag about them, is that they are the number one university in all of Canada when it comes to startup creation. So it's a very, very entrepreneurial um, university that they have a lot of startups spinning out of there and they're trying to commercialize those. Um, but yeah, all the innovations happening inside in SMEs, inside the large corporations. You even have like large majors, major oil and gas companies going to state to, uh, uh, to, to de-risk and to prototype some innovation. So it's really cool there. Um, but yeah, what sectors or industries have the highest potential for innovation? Hydrogen, I, I think definitely hydrogen is a big one. I have a long list. I think of the biggest opportunities here, especially in Alberta, I always say the big three are hydrogen, carbon capture, use and storage, and methane emissions uh, detection and reduction are three big opportunities. I like methane emissions detection and reduction um, because it's helping lengthen the transition. So it's going to help oil and gas uh, do what they do to enable, but at, with lower emissions. And at the same time, some of these other um, areas like hydrogen and electrification and so forth, they need time as well. So this is going to help. They're, they're, they go hand in hand. When it comes to hydrogen, like it's so hyped up right now in Alberta. You have a lot of people, I, you know, who've been around for a long time who've seen this happen before and then it has fizzled. And the reason it's fizzled, this whole hydrogen hype, is because it um, has not been... Uh, like it, there's no business case at the end of the day sometimes and, and it just um, doesn't it just the momentum's not there so we're seeing some major barriers to hydrogen we're really good in Alberta at hydrogen production so there's like that's really good but we're also producing it with emission, so it needs to go from blue hydrogen using natural gas to blue hydrogen capturing it, green hydrogen. And of course, there's some major uh, challenges there. There's some major challenges around transporting it. So we, yes, we can produce it, but then uh, we have to transport it to the point of use. So what we're trying to do at Prairies Can is address those barriers. We're actually trying to figure out how the best ways to transport it. So we're funding some organizations like C4 Technologies. They're actually testing, uh, they're testing in hydrogen environments to see like if they can um, uh, transport hydrogen pipelines because there's like it, 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 there's like deep brittlement in like existing infrastructure and so forth. But the big thing we're trying to do is spur hydrogen use because we can we can produce hydrogen all we want, but if no one's going to use it, like so, who's going to be using hydrogen, right? There's some industrial applications. Um, it, people aren't there's not a lot of hydrogen cars. So co for cars, for passenger vehicles, that's all going to be uh, we think it's going to be all electrification. Um, but where hydrogen could potentially play a big role is with trucks. Um, and uh, because they can go longer distance, they, have, they don't have to refuel very often, it can be in cold weather. So one of Prairie Scan's projects is we, uh, for $4 million, we bought the Alberta Motor Transport Association hydrogen trucks so that they, their uh, carriers can actually trial these trucks in Alberta. Yet again, de-risking, incentivizing, saying, oh crap, we really like these trucks. They're really good. It was, uh, we use them in cold weather and we had real drivers use it in these conditions. Maybe we will invest in some hydrogen trucks. So we'll see. That hasn't happened yet. But the, these hydrogen trucks are being trialed in Alberta right now. So big opportunity for hydrogen. Hoping um, it, it, the momentum keeps going there. Thank you. So whenever we talk about future outlook and trends, obviously it's you know, rapid advancements in technology is going to drive a lot of that. I don't think I've been, I've been to a meeting in the last year where somebody hasn't brought an AI up or you've been to Eco Impact here and you've visited an AI session. So how do you think uh, artificial intelligence or blockchain contributes to the innovation and solutions required for the environmental sustainability needs in Canada? Yeah. Big one. A big one. Yeah. Um, I mean, again, I'm not coming at that from an expertise lens, but I think uh, AI is opening up our imagination to new ways of thinking. Uh, you heard Kevin o open with that and how he uses uh, AI for some of his brainstorming. Um, and I think that uh, part of that, part of the innovation there is we need to be thinking 
laterally. Uh, if anybody's uh, read Edward de Bono, he's popularized this idea of thinking laterally. Instead of thinking in, in analytical step-by-step -step kind of processes, you think a bit more across uh, a spectrum. So I like the idea of a tree um, metaphor. Think about the, the, the trunk being the problem and the roots being part of the solution. And uh, what if you started at the roots and you came up with a whole bunch of solutions and figured out what was the root from the leaves to that, uh, to that solution? Uh, that's kind of lateral thinking. Um, so you come up with all these different possible ways that you could have got to the solution. Um, so I think AI could probably help us think through different solutions. Um, you know, in my world, coming at it from hands-on, on the ground, uh, community engagement. And so I think as much as the AI side of things is good, um, and we're going to learn a lot, I'm not discrediting that, I think also uh, we need to be reconnecting people with nature, uh, getting people getting their hands dirty in the soil, pulling a carrot uh, in the stream, getting your feet wet, uh, forest bathing. Uh, and I think all of that actually contributes to what does it look like to come up with solutions to the biggest challenges that we face right now. So let's not discount uh, the importance of getting our kids off screens and out and dirty and cut and, and what that does to us. Yeah, I know. I absolutely love that. So we're, our family just, if we're, if it goes a week or two where we don't head to the mountains, we're just like, it, there's a pull and we're just love nature. And it's, I think it's really important to instill that into the next generation because, you know, we can get caught up in all this stuff and downtown Calgary and all artificial intelligence and blockchain. But at the end of the day, we need to kind of integrate into nature and actually connect with nature. I think it's really important. Um, but but, you know, I think when it comes to AI and blockchain and machine learning and quantum, like, I don't understand a lot of those technologies, but uh, from what I hear from the ecosystem, you know, some of the, you know, blockchain, I think the jury is still out there. We've been following that sector for a long time and it just doesn't seem to be really gaining a lot of traction, but we see um, artificial intelligence uh, absolutely having a strong role to play in traditional industries. That's where I said that, you know, uh, companies can integrate artificial intelligence into their existing operations and be more efficient for sure. Um, and so we see that as part of the digitization of oil and gas, and there's definitely some programs there. And there's some a lot of organizations that are there to help that Prairies Can is funding. We're funding an organization called Technology Helps. It's like a consultant firm that will go in and help you and help you integrate this stuff. Cybera around data science, we're supporting them. Uh, Amy up in Edmonton. So Edmonton is actually really strong when it comes to artificial intelligence. One of the top centers in the world actually. So they have the uh, Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute up in Edmonton. Uh, Alta ML is a company that will help other companies um, implement and integrate artificial intelligence into their operations. So um, definitely see a strong, strong role there. But of course, there's the I, there's the negative side of, of artificial intelligence, and we need strong regulations. And I think the federal government. This is outside of my purview, but there is some artificial intelligence regulation on the way. Okay, heads up there. So lots to think about here. I'd love to have some audience questions. Hopefully, we prompted some thoughts or ideas. Great, we've got some hands. We've got a team member here with a microphone um, that we can hand forward, and I'd love to have it for the panel. Thank you. Hi there, uh, my name is Neha. Uh, thank you so much for talking about innovative solutions and clean tech and being creative. I mean, that was a great conversation. Thank you so much. Um, I was curious uh, to know a little bit more about um, how are these innovative solutions contributing to the net zero goal that the Canada has? Um, you know, as Dan was talking about yesterday, uh, about eliminating uh, emissions, uh, not just reducing. So, uh, so I was thinking more about like the compliance side of things, and also Luke, as you mentioned, about being reflective um, about the the solutions that are being implemented. So I was just curious to know, like, uh, are, like more about the studies being done to make sure they're effective, uh, these solutions. Um, yeah, thank you. Do you want to start with that? 
Sure. Jump off. Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much for the for the question. So it's actually really interesting. It's an interesting question for Prairies Kent. So we are an economic development agency. So our return on investment is our economic outcomes. Um, it goes without saying that if we're looking at clean tech initiatives, there's going to be a benefit to the environment, be it emissions, be it water, be it bio biodiversity or whatnot. But we actually don't measure that as a department. And that's something that we might want to discuss inside Prairies Can to Im improve that measurement. So for us, all our initiatives, are, are, are all our KPIs, our performance outcomes are economic related. So how many jobs are being created, how many revenues are being created inside the companies, um, how much investment they're attracting, and it kind of goes without saying. It's clean tech, it's going to reduce emissions, but we don't measure that. There are some other organizations that do do that. So Emissions Reduction Alberta is a crown corporation arm's length of the provincial government. They're getting all the tier funding, so the carbon tax funding, and then they're reinvesting it into uh, demonstrations, into companies, and so forth. Their return on investment are emissions reduction, so they're measuring that. And um, so, I mean, yeah, long story short, we're not actually, we're kind of saying this is, you know, in our write-up subjectively, qualitatively for all our initiatives, we are positioning it as this will help Canada achieve its net zero goals because it's going to do X, Y, Z, such as the energy transition center, such as these hydrogen trucks, if and when they get adopted, or all these uh, methane emissions reduction pilots that we're doing. So, yeah. They're definitely contributing, but um, it's not something we're measuring right now. Good question. Thank you. I got two quick points on that. Um, I think from our vantage point, we're trying to learn more about nature-based solutions and how our conservation work uh, has a measurable impact on, on climate. Um, and so we've got scientists and we've got folks learning and trying to figure out how to calculate it better. We're still in that early stage of, of learning it all. And so I would say one of the things we're trying to avoid is jumping ahead of ourselves and getting into the greenwashing marketing side and saying stuff that we're not confident in. So I would just advise to be cautious about uh, getting the marketing ahead of the actual transparency, accountability part of the dynamic it, in an effort to look good. And that's that shot a few companies in the foot in the past. So. Thank you. Any other questions? I see a few hands. That's great. Hi. So, um, Derek, you mentioned earlier that everyone in this room um, has the quality of life they do because of the, or, um, in this, sorry, everyone in this room has the quality of life that they do because of corporate development. And then, Luke, at the same time, you said that the importance of building a strong ecosystem and building a strong business relies on diversifying leadership, which kind of feels a little bit like a contradictory statement, considering corporate development has significantly been a detriment to a very important population in the remediation of what's going on uh, in regards to eco-development. So I'm just wondering, with all of that in mind, as leaders in this field, how are you setting precedence as leaders in this industry without distorting the importance of Indigenous advisory or foregoing the remediation of corporate relationships and responsibilities with treaty land and treaty people? Yeah. I, I mean, it's 100% a, 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 a very important question. And, you know, I'll probably be really challenged. It, it's hard to reconcile, right? You know, for me as an economic developer, it, it really is my responsibility to, that's my job, right? I, I'm reporting on that. But inside of that, we are also investing heavily into indigenous inclusion, uh, women inclusion, um, youth, and so forth. So we have funded a big, that is like a big priority bucket for us. So we have the sector priorities that I talked about, ag, clean tech, advanced manufacturing, digital tech, life sciences. One full bucket is inclusiveness, and a big part of our funding goes towards um, creating an inclusive economy. And our president, the president of Prairie's Economic Development Canada, says not only is it the right thing to do, but it's actually good for business as well um, to lift up um, underrepresented voices um, that have, have, have not had a say in the 
the past. So we're doing things like work integrated learning, uh, center of excellence uh, for indigenous students outside of Lethbridge. Um, you know, we funded uh, a couple million dollars to an organization called Student Energy to, to lift up the youth voice around energy transition. Um, we're funding indigenous entrepreneurs that are looking at contributing to the energy transition through an amazing organization called the Energy Futures Lab. So it, it's 100% a priority, but you're right, it's so hard to reconcile. Yeah. I'll jump off that. That's a great question. Um, we've been learning a lot as we've partnered with the Semiamu First Nation, and uh, Chief Harley has been generous and kind to let us share that story. Um, and and we've done a number of training uh, experiences with that community, including learning about indigenous law and learning about indigenous wisdom and knowledge and um, how that integrates with, with kind of a colonial settler organization that we are. Um, so there's lots to learn. And you know, getting on my soapbox again a little bit, uh, we, we had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the calls to action and uh, hopefully you've got a chance to read all those. It's, it's excellent and very important. Uh, and one of the things that stood out to me is uh, my, my proclivity to jump to reconciliation before actually sitting in the truth. And so what we're trying to do as an organization is just hear the stories, learn, understand. Uh, you know, we can't restore relationship with uh, each other and with the land unless we understand the, the stories and the truth. Um, so hold those things together as you engage truth and reconciliation. Um, and one of those things is uh, one of our nature centers is in Manitoba, East Braintree, Manitoba, uh, and it's really close to Shoal Lake. And if you know Shoal Lake, it's where Winnipeg gets a lot of almost all of its water and there's an aqueduct, but it had a huge negative impact on the First Nation community there. And we're just beginning to understand those stories. And, um, and so that is part of the reconciliation journey. Yeah. yeah. Here, here. That's great. Thank you. We're actually at the, uh, the top of the hour here. So unless there's one quick one, uh, we can maybe get through before we let these gents go. So I want to say miigwech for you know, sharing your, your knowledge, your perspectives, and all the work that you're doing. I've struggled for a long, long time in my journey working for companies and governments and there's a total lack of courageous leadership in this country. And my question is, where do we find those voices of reason like the Dalai Lamas and the Martin Luther Kings? I know they're hiding in the margins of society because a lot of you are sitting in this room. How do we empower those people? To, to move up because they say you work from the top down, but when that leadership is not there, what, what do we do? Because I, I end up moving from place to place to place to try to find my, my safe ethical space to work for these CEOs, and it's tough. But how do we do that? How do we encourage and empower people to move up in these positions when we see, I see that courage, but there's, there's a block, there's a barrier, there's a gap. Yeah, no, here, here, I think I, there are 100% is, and, you know, as a white 44-year-old man up here, you know, I'm, I'm probably not the best place to kind of say this is how we should do it and so forth, but I do know that there's a lot of uh, extremely intelligent individuals inside government and Prairies Can and so forth that are working at this, and, and it's about elevating voices inside government, inside leadership positions. Actually, I just had a really good conversation two nights ago with an organization called MESH. They, they run a conference and they uh, had a round table of, um, uh, uh, of people uh, uh, from underrepresented populations and said, how can we bring the, how can we bring out some of the voices inside the innovation ecosystem in Calgary? Because a lot of people don't see themselves at some of the accelerators like CDL Rockies or plug and play or SVG you thrive um, and how can we incentivize them or make them feel more comfortable bring them psychological safety to say you belong you can do that as well and we were having those conversations all the time so yeah yeah we're trying appreciate the comment thank you yeah is it Winona 
Yeah, well, thanks for sharing your story on the first day there. Uh, and I certainly don't have an answer to that question. I think it's, it's a good challenge and call to courageous leadership. Um, so more just reflective thoughts uh, on the soft skills of life. You know, how do we learn to listen to each other again? Um, how do we practice humility? Um, and how do we actually, one of the things that is core to our innovation as an organization is being around the table over a meal. Uh, that's, that's common ground, as it were. And it's a way to draw out stories um, in a safe, safer space often. And then when we hear those stories, what do we do? Do we celebrate the right things and do we lift up and empower uh, the people in that mix who, who maybe get pushed to the margins occasionally. So I think that is the hard work of leadership and it takes tons of courage. And you know the social fabric of our, our society really depends on the soft skills that, uh, that we need to re relearn and regrow in um, as we navigate this. So Essential skills. Essential, yes, I like that. Essential skills. <clears throat> One of the goals of Eco Impact is for people to come here, network, learn, and take things back to the office and, and really you know, share some of the thoughts and the learnings here. So I think that's a great um, kind of note to cap this conversation off with. I think it's something we can all carry forward and talk amongst each other. So thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Luke, Derek, for your thought leadership on this. Um, hopefully you all found it um, valuable. And thank you very much for showing. Uh, just thank you very much. And uh, enjoy the rest of the sessions today. Thank you.